Lord, we just want to lift Rachel up to you now. And we, just as she leads in, us now in your word, I pray, Holy Spirit, you would touch her, that you would enfold her, and that you would give her a real sense of your presence as she leads. Thank you, Jesus. And may our hearts be open to being challenged, to being changed, and to being renewed. Amen. Thanks, Chris. I think um, those words, you know, when, when we sin, when we, in that confession, that is all about have we put God first? Have we put other people? Do we love other people and do we love ourselves? It's just common themes that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so I'm talking about singleness, and this is such a huge topic. And I've got one, one Sunday to talk about it. But I cannot cover every single thing that I would like to cover. Um, I also am very aware that this is a subject that is, some people have been incredibly hurt. It's a subject that contains a lot of pain for a lot of people. I'm also very aware that I am predominantly speaking from this from a female point of view. I have sat and chatted with a lot of my um, single Christian men friends um, just to hear their, their opinions and how they experience life as a single person in the church. Um, so I'm trying to do it as balanced as I can. But that's kind of my caveat. So today, I saw a sentence in a book that I was reading, which it wasn't actually about singleness. It was about leadership. And it was called how to, be, how to Have a Healthy Single Life. And I just love that title. It's like, how do we live healthily as a single person? So that's kind of what I want to talk about. And if you're married, do not switch off, because there's a lot in here for you as well. So first of all, how many of the UK population do you think is single? So what is the percentage of single people in the UK from 20 to 100? Any guesses? Yep, spot on. 40%. Okay, now is that evenly spread or is it a mix at one end of the generation gap or at the bottom end? Or is it evenly spread? Yeah, it's even. And actually, it's increasing. There are more and more single people in, in the UK, according to the Office of National Statistics. Now, when they are classifying at single people, it's people who are not in a long-term relationship. So that's where they put single people at. And the Single Friendly Church have also categorized different groups of single people because it contains a whole wide range of people from different ages to different generations and, and people. And they all have their own unique needs. The needs of a 20-year-old single person is very different from somebody who's 80 and single. So we have, the first group is never married with no children. This number is increasing especially amongst men. And there's been a recent study of that more women are refusing to commit to a relationship with a man because they consider a lot of the men who are single to be emotionally immature. Which, and we do not, as, as women, we do not need a man because we can work independently. We, can, we have fun access to being out and actually being independent. So why would we settle to live with a man who's emotionally immature when we can do everything else, pretty much ourselves? And then you have the single parent who has never been married. So they've got kids they need to bring up. Um, so it says here 86% of them are women. And they have the sole responsibility of bringing up a child. Some of them do not receive any support from the father of their kids. So they have a completely different range of needs to the single person without kids. Then you've got the separated, the newly separated. Now this is a whole another kind of group of people who have emotional needs. 
because they're particularly vulnerable because they're coming out of a long-term relationship. They're sorting out the logistics of living arrangements, legal matters, sorting out kids and, and stuff like that. You know, they're still legally married, but in effect, they're single. And then you have the divorced people with no children. And some people think, well, it's like, okay, it's easy for them to move on because they have no children to consider. But for some of them, especially women, when they divorce, it means that their dream of having a family, a dream of having kids has ended. And so they have to deal with not only the grief of the relationship ending, but the grief of possibly having a family ending. And that's, then there's the widowed. And actually, many widowed people do not consider themselves to be single. They say they're still married, but their spouse has passed on. And those group of people, there are so many different needs that I cannot go into detail. I do not have experience of every single one of those. So I'm not going to address them as particular groups. Also not included in the 40% but are found in the church are the married people who are single, who are living in single in practice. So those could be the people who are at home and for whatever reason their spouse is living away. Whether they're working away on, you know, they're in the army but they need, their job takes them away or whether they're in prison or whether they're in care. You know, they're legally married, but their lives are single people, and they have to live with that, which is, again, a completely different need. And there are married people whose partner doesn't come to their church, and they're seen as single in the church. And again, it's a completely different need. So each category of people have their own unique set of challenges. Single Friendly Church surveyed over 3,000 single Christians and they found that the majority of these Christians who went to church felt excluded, hurt, isolated and unwelcomed in the church to the point that they have left the church. And as a single woman, I have felt excluded, hurt, isolated, overlooked and unwelcome in the church. So this is real. The church should be a place where every single person feels, wel feels welcomed and loved. Where every single person can come into this church and feel valued for who they are. Not because of their relationship status. Not because of their sex. Not because of who they are, who they belong to. Not because of the ethnic group they belong to. They need to be loved because of they, who they are in Jesus. And it's time the church starts, stops judging people. And starts loving people. The church, we need to be so much better at supporting single people. They are so often abused in the church because they're considered of having too much more time than married people. Single people are made in the image of God. Every single person in this room is made in the image of God. There isn't anything wrong with a person who is single. We do not need to be fixed or married off. I'm going to say that again. Single people do not need to be fixed. There is nothing wrong with you if you are single. But we are made to feel like there is something wrong with us. Okay, so single people. How can you be healthily single? The first point is, like everything, know who you are in Christ. Your relationship with God needs to be your number one priority. And it goes for everybody, whatever your relationship status is. Your number one relationship is with God. Married people, it's not with your spouse, it's with God. It's not with your kids, it's with God. You've got to put him first, but above all things. 1 Peter 2 says this, As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into the spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, 
See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Now there are so many passages that I could have used to describe our identity in God. But I think this one has particular significance for single people. Because as a single person, you often feel rejected. You often feel like there is something wrong with you, whether that's because you're not in a relationship and you think, why does nobody love me? Is there something wrong with me? Why has that person left me? Is there something wrong with me? We feel rejected because we're not in a relationship. We can be feel rejected by the church because we're not invited to events. Because we have the married couples who go off and do their own things as, married, as different groups of married couples, but do not think to ask the single person. Or the single person is the one who can babysit. As a single person, I do not have an issue going out with my married friends. So why does that make other people feel uncomfortable inviting a single person out with married couples? I felt rejected because I felt like the leaders in a church all had to be married. They were all married. And as a single person, I couldn't be a leader. I couldn't surf in certain teams because I felt like I needed to be married or in a relationship. And years ago, there were a time when there was loads of single people in the church. And we used to hang out loads. And then all of a sudden, everybody coupled up and got married. And then all of a sudden, I was excluded. I never got invited out to go for a drink or get invited around for dinner because all the married couples wanted to stay in their married couples. And they didn't know what to do with me. But in this one Peter passage, it says a living stone, who is Jesus, was rejected by humans. But he was chosen by God and was precious to God. And it says that we are also like these precious living stone. So we are not rejected by God. God does not reject you. He sees us as precious stones, as li a living house for him. Number two, acknowledge the pain you're in. Paul writes about being content in all circumstances. And I do believe that we do need to learn to be content. And that comes from being more secure in identity as a child of God. And when we base our significance on our relationship with God. But we're also living in the clash of the two ages, the now and the not yet. The kingdom of God is here, but it's not actually realized. So that's why there is still pain in this world. And we need to be real with our emotions. God cares exactly how we feel. But unfortunately, the church has become a place where it's, everybody puts a mask on. We're afraid to admit how we're feeling. We go to church and you see these super high, like shiny people where ever life is wonderful. You see these smug married couples with their perfect married life and everything is rosy because that's what they present to us as single people. And there are particular emotions that we're not allowed to express in church because they're considered ungodly. And we're so we're told to suppress them. And to be honest, I'm not entirely sure where that idea comes from. I haven't yet found a place in the Bible where it's told, do not suppress your emotions. Because if you read the Psalms, it's full of emotions. And David, who wrote the Psalms, was known as a man who was after God's own heart. That's how he was known. But if you read the Psalms, I mean, he's telling God to kill his enemies. And that's not a man who we perceive to be after God's heart because he's telling God to kill people he doesn't like. But yet, David was known to be a worshipper, a lover of Jesus. But and he wasn't afraid to express his emotions to God. Disappointment, grief, loneliness, shame, hurt, resentment, jealousy, are all emotions that we feel, especially if you're single. They're all important emotions. And it doesn't make us any less spiritual if we have those emotions. 
It doesn't make us any less spiritual if we say them out loud. So go to God with your pain. Go to God with your frustrations and your disappointments. Share it with trusted friends. You don't need to share the whole world. But go to people who you feel safe to admit these great feelings with. And if necessary, seek professional help. It doesn't make you any less of a follower of Jesus to share these emotions. In fact, the times that I've done this, I've actually felt closer to God. The third point. Stop waiting and start living. Your life doesn't begin when you get married. Now, for some reason, you kind of get told, I've grown up in a church, you get told, especially if you're female, that when you get married, that's when you're a proper adult. That's when you will. And I kind of looked up at all these married couples and thinking, well, it's okay, I'm not a proper adult yet, that's okay. Because, you know, these, these smug married people, they seem like they have everything together, everything perfect and wonderful. And I'm not quite at that point yet, so I, maybe I'm not properly grown up. But let me tell you something. Nobody actually feels like a proper grown-up. <laughs> you know, we're kind of going through life, kind of just making up as we go along. That's the reality of being an adult. And it's the same if you're married. You're still making up as you go along. But there's this perception that once you're married, you've got everything sorted, and there you can go and begin your life. And chatting to my male friends, they feel the pressure to get married. But they've also acknowledged it's worse for single women. When I finished um, university and came back to Milton Keynes, nobody was interested in what I was going to do with my degree. The one question I got asked time and time again was, when are you going to get married? And there's still places I go to, there's still people I don't see regularly, and it's like, so uh, when are you going to get married? Your time's running up soon. Okay. You know, nobody was interested in my career plans or my plans for my future other than I needed to find a husband and have kids and settle down because that's what I was meant to do. And whenever I've gone to a wedding, people come up to me and say, don't worry, love, you'll be next. <laughs> Every single wedding, I have been told that by somebody. I don't know how many weddings I've been to, but I'm going to be next, apparently. There are many people who put their lives on hold because they believe the myth that their life doesn't start until they get married. They spend every single moment, you know, on dating sites, obsessing about finding their perfect husband and wife. And if you believe your life doesn't really begin until you have a family and get married, it can lead you to becoming desperate. And I've seen this in so many people. You know, they settle for the first person who expresses an interest in that person. But it may not be the best person for them. It may not be the person that God's called them. He's going to encourage them to live the life that God has called this person to live. And I've seen so many of my friends settle because they're scared of being on their own. So instead of putting your life on hold to find your spouse, go to God and say, God, what is it you want me to do today? What is it you want me to do this week? And then go and do it. By all means, pray about your future. Pray about your future spouse. But do not obsess about it. Because we do not live in the future, we live in the now. And if we continue to live in the future, then we're not going to be any use for the now. But by living in the present, by doing that one thing that God is asking you to do, you might suddenly find your spouse. And he's going to, he or she is going to be the one that's going to help you fulfill God's calling for your life. The fourth point, build community. Find people who you can be family with. people who you can be completely honest with. There are moments when you come home from a day at work, shut the door, and you're suddenly on your own. And that can be the worst place for you to be. And even if you are in a family, you've got a home situation, there are other people around you, they may not ask you stuff, but you're not on your own. 
And sometimes you just want a bit of company while you're watching TV. That's all you need. You don't necessarily need a conversation. You just need to know somebody's there. Or you come home, you've had a terrible day, and you just need to have a bit of a vent. And you just, or you just want somebody to ask you, how was your day? You don't have that. You have to go out your way to find those relationships, or you might have to pick up the phone. And that takes effort. And when you've had a busy day, you don't necessarily want that. The longer you are single in the church, the less relationships you have with people in the church that can build you up. Especially when you're in any form of relationship, any form of leadership. People may ask how you are, but they don't necessarily want to hear the answer. They might ask out of politeness because they want you to do something. And that's the worst kind of, of, kind of asking somebody how you are. I get loads of messages where people say, Hi, how Rachel, how are you? Hope you're having a good week. Can you do this for me? But nobody, very few people actually generally say, How are you? And the church is terrible at using single people because of the myth that we may have more time than married couples. The reality is that we actually have different time demands. We have different demands on our time and resources. Which brings me on to my next point, don't be afraid to ask for help. Because singleness brings with it its limited resources. It's just you on your own. You've got nobody to share the load of doing life with. You're the person who has to find the money to pay your rent. You're the person who has to work out all this complicated, you know, insurance, paperwork, you know, council stuff, all that stuff that, you know, is really dull and can be quite confusing. You've got to do that all by yourself. If you're living by yourself, you're the only person having to do all the housework. It's expensive living on your own because you have nobody to share the financial burdens with. Cooking for yourself, cooking for one person, is actually quite expensive. It's cheaper to cook in bulk, cook for loads of people. And to be honest, I hate cooking just for myself. I'd much rather cook for loads of people. But when it comes to cooking for myself, I'm just like, oh, just a bit of toast or cereal. <laughs> So don't be afraid to ask for help. If you need help fixing something in your garden, and you're like, I'm no good at that, I just need some help doing that, go and ask for help. Don't try and spend ages figuring it out on yourself. Just ask people, have that community around you where you can go, do you know what, I've got this big job I need to do in my garden, I need a bit of help doing it because I can't do it by myself. Now, I'm all for like, strong, independent women doing stuff themselves, but I also know my own limitations. So, ask for help. Get people around you to, who can help you do things. Number six. Have interests and relationships with people outside the church. Like I said before, I think the church does a very good job at abusing single people. But also, ask yourself the question, what and who restores my soul? What fills me with delight? and make time to do it in the week. Self-care isn't selfish. And we need to make sure that we are looking after ourselves so that we can serve other people better. um, Jesus says this in Matthew um, 22. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love your Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So if you don't love yourself, how are you going to love other people? And that's why I think it's important to actually have interests outside church. To do other things, to meet other people. Have fun. Because I don't think it's, impo- I think it's really hard as single people to 
But it's really hard to single people to get caught up in doing church stuff. And sometimes we can use it as a way of hiding our loneliness because we know there's going to be people there. Even if sometimes it's a bit superficial, the relationships we have with people in the church, sometimes it's so easy to go and do something for the church because it fulfills a relationship. It, it, it stops us feeling lonely. And also there's this myth that if you're single and you don't have kids, then you've got all the time in the world. But we don't. The demands on our time is so different from that on as a family. I do admit that. We do not have to worry about feeding kids, picking kids up from school, or putting them to bed. But there's only one of us in a home. Some of us, I know so many single people who have more than one job, more than one full-time job, because they need two incomes to pay the bill. There's only one of them, so they've got to work twice as hard. So the reality is, if you're single, you do not have as much time. But I do think the church has a habit of making single people feel guilty for saying no to things. Or making them feel like, oh, they need to stay late to clear up because we've got kids, because people have got kids to put to bed. So if you feel like you're going to church and it becomes a burden, you've got this one activity and it's just, you have to do it week in, week out, you're getting no help and you've got a really busy busy schedule at at work and time is intense and it feels like it's dragging you down, then that's not healthy. If you feel like that, then come to me or Chris and we'll see what we can do. We don't want to be a burden to people. Jesus says in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for my souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus promises us that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So what we do for the church should not wear us down week in and week out. Yes, some weeks are going to be hard. Some weeks are going to be difficult. Some weeks we don't want to get out of bed and go on a church on a Sunday morning. But if it's every single week, then it's okay to stop. Guilt is a terrible noose to let go of. And it hangs around our necks. And we get told that we need to do this. We get made to feel guilty. But Jesus doesn't make you feel guilty. So don't use how you serve in the church to hide from the loneliness of being single. Start to build authentic relationships with people in the church. Don't use how you serve in the church to find your significance. If you find your significance in a particular role, then that's not right. But make sure you don't neglect your relationship with God because you're too busy doing church. Just because somebody is doing lots of things in the church doesn't mean their relationship with God is good. So... Married people. How can you support single people? Because we need support. So we're meant to live in community. And one thing I would say is get to know single people. We're not freaks, we're not weirdos. There's nothing wrong with us. Well, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) You know, but we can say that same about everybody. (laughs) Everybody has their unique challenges. But we're still people. We still need to feel loved and valued, not seen as a role and and somebody who can do something for somebody else. In Genesis 2, it says, The Lord, it is not good for man to be alone, and I will make make a a suitable helper for him. You know, it's not good to be on our own. It's not good to see people on their own struggling. We're all required to live in community where everybody feels included. So are we making a single person feel welcome? Are you inviting them round for dinner with no other agenda except just to get to know them as a person? Are we inviting them out and not expecting anything in return? Because the reality is, if you invite somebody round for dinner, you expect them to invite you round for dinner again. But sometimes if you're single, you do not have the space in a house because you cannot afford a big house. 
So it's hard for single people to invite people back, or they live in a house share, or their living arrangements are very complicated. They may not be able to do what you give them if you expect something back. Galatians 6 says this, carry each other's burdens, and in, in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So help carry the burdens of the single person because they're carrying it all by themselves. And do not judge single people. I think there's a tendency in church, um, or it appears sometimes that married couples feel like they've got everything together. That's the impression that they give off to us. And, and we joke about smug married couples. And that's how they make us feel as single people. They say, make us feel less of a person. So do, does your behavior as a married couple, do you judge people by just the way you behave and treat people? In Romans 12, it says this from verse 3, For by grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to, but rather think yourself with sober judgments in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of you have one body with many members, and these members do not have the same function, so in Christ, though we are many, we form one body, and each member belongs to each other. So do you, make, do you feel superior to other people? Or do you give off the impression that you feel superior to other people? That's what you need to be asking yourself. I've heard so many single friends, especially single mums, who feel like they've become a, a church project. Where they feel like people feel, make themselves feel good about themselves by helping that poor single mum who needs extra help. But in reality, all she needs is friendship. Do you do things for people in order to make yourselves look good? There are many, I know many single women with children who have felt excluded from events because they need somebody to either look after the kids or bring their kids along because they have no partner to look after the children. Single people are made in the image of God, carriers of, their spirit, of his spirit. We are no different to married people in that sense. We just have different needs we're not some project to make people look good or feel better about themselves. We just want to be loved. God sees single and married people the same. Okay, number two. No matchmaking. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm going to say, I have been set up by so many different men all on the time says, there's a nice Christian man here. We think you get on. He's Christian. Meet the guy. Absolutely nothing in common. Or if I'm talking to a single person, in the, a single man in the church, all of a sudden I'm married off to this person and the gossip goes around that I'm dating this person and I've just had one conversation with this person. It's real. It happens. Or you get told, don't worry, love, I'm praying for a husband for you. Well, that's great. But can you pray for some other stuff? But I also don't want a husband like your husband. <laughs> because then in reality, it's, they want that relationship. They want to put me in that box of being a submissive wife. And it's painful when you get that every single week. So no matchmaking. Just stop it. Because it is so painful for people. And I know we laugh about it, but actually when it happens all the time, it's actually incredibly hurtful because you're, you know you are seen as being, as there's possibly something wrong with you because you're not married. Our significance comes from not who we're married to, but from God. And I think some of it can be, like I was saying, like I, it's really hard if I suddenly talk to a, a single man because it, 
you know, I get married off to this person. And it doesn't actually come to me. But I hear it in talks. It talk, talk, people will talk about it, and I hear it. And isn't gossip a sin? 2 Corinthians says, For I am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as where I want you to be, and you may, know, may not find me as you want it to be. I fear that they may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. Now, I think a lot of that, a lot of the kind of matchmaking, the gossiping about people, the praying for people in prayer meetings, actually fits a lot of that. And it's rife in church. But, and it's all disguised as, we care for this person. We're just going to pray for this person because that's what we're meant to do. But actually, you're just gossiping. You're just slandering people. And Paul says that's wrong. That is a sin. That is even as sinful as all the other kind of sexual sins that we focus so much on. So don't focus on matchmaking people. They are a complete person just by themselves because they've got God. And the final one I've touched a lot on is don't put extra demands on single people. We've got enough of our own demands. So don't expect them to do everything in the church. Don't expect them to be at every event. Don't expect them to be serving in every single team. Because we don't have time. So we have the right to our own life. We have the right to spending time with our friends and family because actually they are our family. And it takes more effort for us to go out and meet our friends because they don't live with us. Um, 1 Corinthians, Paul writes how a single person has more time for the Lord's affairs. And I think this is where it comes down to people thinking, well, if you're single, you've got more time for the Lord's affairs, which means you've got more time for church. There is a big difference between being concerned for the Lord's affairs and being concerned for church. They are not the same thing. You can be busy doing church and doing everything in the church, but you have no relationship with God. You're not actually concerned with the Lord's affairs. So just because somebody is single doesn't mean they have to spend every moment of their free time doing things for church. They need to put their relationship with God first because that is everybody's number one priority. So if you find there is a single person who is constantly serving in church, you know, there are every single different church events, find out why. You know, come up to them and say, I've noticed you're doing a lot for church. You seem really busy and you've got You've got a really busy work schedule. Is is there anything that's going on? What you you know, find out the reason why they're doing it. Get to know that person as a person, not as a role. Because we are more than that. Okay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about celibacy just to finish off. Um, I've been reading, I've like been saying, I've been reading a book, um, The Emotionally Healthy Leader by Peter Shiresiro, um, which actually isn't about singleness and relationships, but it's such a good book, but it does talk a little bit about singleness. And he talks about there are two different types of celibates. So the first one is a vowed celibate. And they make a vow of lifetime of celibacy for the kingdom of God. Jesus says that only a few people are called to this. Matthew 19, the disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, is it better not to marry? Jesus replied, not everybody can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given to. So you see a lot of these um, people who have been called to be celibate and vowed celibacy are in religious orders. They're your nuns, your monks. But before they make that vow, they have to give five to seven years of discernment before making that vow. It's not a decision to rush into lightly, like marriage. 
So there are people who were called to a lifetime of celibacy, but it's only a few people, and only after a lot of discernment. And then there are the dedicated celibates. Those who practiced celibacy as long as they remained unmarried as part of their commitment to God. And this is where the majority of single people will fall into. Now, I believe that God designed sex to be enjoyed within the confines of a committed, long-term relationship. But what, for whatever reason that doesn't happen to you, the church is very good at making people feel shame. They make people feel like they are damaged goods. And we spoke about this a few weeks ago in the purity culture. And we saw how in the creation story, God's original t- intentions for the world was there for there to be no shame. So when Adam and Eve you know, ate the apple, shame entered the world because they sinned. But God sent Jesus to return to the way, to, t- to turn the rail to the way he originally intended it. There is no shame in the kingdom of God. Shame has a way of oppressing people and exerting power over people, making people feel terrible, especially women. It's funny how shame, especially in regards to sex, falls heavily on women. Men seem to get away with it, and women don't. Paul writes in Galatians 5, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by yoke of slavery. And some people feel that yoke of slavery is a shame they feel because they feel judged by the church because of their sexual sin. But Paul says there is no shame. God brings freedom to us. And through his time on earth, Jesus met with the sinners of the world. He enjoyed dinners with tax collectors, prostitutes. You know, he had women sitting at his feet, being taught by him. You know, this was such radical behavior in this culture of the time. And it was especially controversial as Jesus was considered a rabbi who didn't associate with those people. I'm going to share the story that we shared when we talked about the purity culture. And this is from John 8. I didn't write down the reference. (laughs) John 8. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people were gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made a stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this time, those who heard began to go away, one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and live and believe your life of sin. So the Pharisees, they, the religious leaders of the time, brought Jesus a woman caught in adultery. And it was cons- customary to stone that woman because they were now considered spoiled goods. And like I said before, it takes two people to be adulterous. So where was the man? Because they it also spoiled goods. But what did Jesus do instead of stoning that woman? He said to the Pharisees, let any one of you who 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 is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And each of the Pharisees started walking away without stoning the woman. And then when Jesus stood up, no one else was there. And so he said, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she says then neither do I. Jesus is the only person who had no sin. He was the only person who had the right to condemn her, to judge her. Yet he didn't. 
He didn't condemn her, he set her free. Jesus doesn't condemn you for your past mistakes. Jesus doesn't condemn you if you've had sex outside marriage. Jesus doesn't condemn you. His death on the cross set you free from shame. Others condemn us. Others will judge us. Because they see that we actually don't understand you being single. As a single person, you do get judged. You get judged by people in the church. But Jesus has harsh words for people who judge others. We can condemn ourselves and feel not worthy of God's love. But Jesus' death on that cross, he paid the punishment for us. He set us free. You know, God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. So we are free to live a life worthy of his calling. Because even if we're single, we can live a life worthy of his calling. Because all people, whether you're single, whether you're married, male or female, whatever your background, every single person is precious in the eyes of God. And we need to learn to see that in people. To treat every single person as somebody who carries God's spirit. Let's stand.